the attempt to send a human to Mars will steal an honor from Cotter. Okay, so the process of sending somebody to Mars mm -hmm. is going to mean that those in Cutter lose an honor. That's what's going to happen. All right, up, up, and away. Here we go. <laughs> Welcome to the Knock On Effect, where we start with the thing you know and end up in a strange and perhaps intergalactic place. I'm joined today by my stellar co-host, Justine Underhill. Oh, I thank you. And of course, our out-of-this-world professor Absolutely. here in the flesh. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Roger Hurst, how are you? Great. So our job, Justine, is to get you from a Martian expedition to, to Qatari uh, uh, gloom. Okay. And uh, your job is to figure out where we're going before we get there. So with that in mind, would you like to hazard an early guess? I'm trying to think of what Cutter is known for. Um, it's known for oil, and it's also known for the World Cup. Um, that's about to Ooh, happen. Yeah. But I'm trying to think of to how that relates to going to Mars. Um, perhaps mining for something on Mars means that uh, Cutter won't be seeing as much income. I don't know. Okay. Because like, because not... yeah, maybe mining for like I don't know some sort of resource on Mars is the same resource that they have in Cutter. Okay. How would you grade that? I'll give that. I'm going to give that some like an eight out of ten. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's reasonable. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm wow. a good student here. And I see you've got your sort of space man, not space man, but your baddie James Bond space kind of villain's outfit on today. <laughs> I don't know what he's saying, but I, I think you're right. I, uh, is that a compliment? It's a compliment. It, it is a compliment, Good. Yes. I'll, yeah, I'll like, take it. Yeah. Um, so it's no secret that we are trying to get to Mars. A lot of countries have their eye on it. We're going to focus on the U.S. Probably has the best chance, just, just to be fair. NASA's looking to send someone to Mars um, in the 2030s at some point, like a human, actual human being. Uh, NASA is looking to uh, send a new rover up to Mars uh, in a couple of years as part of its Mars 2020 program. Just, I want to be clear, it's not to be confused with Mars 2112, the defunct novelty restaurant that was in Times Square. I had never heard of that one. It, it was really fun. It was a good time. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I know. I was so sad when it closed. I was like eight. I was prime Martian years. And, right. and it was gone. But uh, getting back to ma the matter at hand, yeah, so looking to send another rover by 2020, and the ultimate goal is to get humans to Mars perhaps in the 2030s. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this is the last time that man stepped foot on the moon was 1972. And since then, we kind of said, oh, we got it. We did, we, we did it. We went there. You know, it, it's kind of like the botanical gardens. Mm. You go, we went there. Uh, we don't have to don't go back. Don't want to go back. But, but, and then with, there was the shuttle program, uh, beautiful things such as these, uh, which then, I think they were a little more expensive than this model. Yeah, this was a little plasticky. And, and that was discontinued too after some catastrophes and after just sort of a lack, a uh, feeling of what are we doing. So now we're actually trying to go, and, and uh, not we, but NASA's trying to get back to the moon and I have here their 2019 budget estimates. Ooh. Ah. Wait, so we are trying to go back to the moon right now? Yes. And you would think... Why? Right. And here is the chart that explains why. Basically... Wow. So this is... I know, they really... Wow. I they, went they, all out on the graphics yeah. there. <laughs> well, when you're asking for $20 billion, you, you know, throw a couple bucks to the graphic designers. But so here we are. That's Earth. This is the moon. And then this is Mars. So, this is not a um, to scale. scale yeah. And so the idea is by going to the moon, we'll first of all, you know, discover more about that that thing in the sky, but we'll also learn more about ex exploration and learn about, you know, how humans do in rockets and, and things we can do. And that will set the stage to eventually send humans to Mars. Okay, so one step leads to the next. And and so one small step for yeah. Well, and so the point is that we would be living on Mars? Like, what's, what's, or living on the moon? Like, what's the point here? So it'd be nice to do some long-term stuff on, on the moon. Uh, no, the point is just to... Uh, explore. Go, to explore. You know, it's, it's science, right? We're, we're going to learn what it's like. And there's also some, some flag planting stuff that goes on, right? And all the libertarians um, that want to live on Mars maybe have a little bit more hope. Gosh, it's like it's like you know where we're going before we get there. So, uh -oh. <laughs> um, I, and and now the interesting thing is they asked for uh, a lot of money here. They asked for about twenty billion dollars there uh, for twenty nineteen. The original uh, fiscal twenty nineteen. The original ask was for 
just $19 billion, and they actually got $20.7 billion. So Congress is really throwing a lot of money at NASA. Um, of course, it's not as much as they used to have. In, in the 60s, when we were trying to get to the moon for the first time, 5% of the federal budget and 0.7% of the entire GDP went to NASA. Whereas now it's more like 0.5% of the federal budget and 0.1% of GDP. So as they're trying to go to deep space, as they're trying to go to Mars, they are cutting back on the things that they don't want to do anymore um, and sort of farming that out. So, ah. so, it, so it's very interesting. They, they, they write here that um, we're choosing to, quote, prioritize human exploration and related activities. Um, as part of an overall plan to, quote, expand exploration by providing funding to start transition of low Earth orbit human spaceflight operations to commercial partners. What? Well, well, this is, we, we're familiar with companies like SpaceX. With, okay, yeah. With um, Virgin Galactic, which is with Blue, Blue Origin. Origin. Yeah. There you go, Jeff Bezos' company. Um, and and it, 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 there's a big kind of push overall to go into shallow space. This is an interesting paper uh, by Matthew Weinzierl called Space, the F Final Economic Frontier. This was published earlier this year in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. I never miss an issue of... Okay, you're an avid reader. The Journal of uh, Good to know. Economic Perspectives. Um, and so w what it kind of explains is that we started with a command and control model. We started with the government saying, all right, let's get a man in orbit. You do this, you do this. Let's get a man on the moon. You do this, you do this, you do this. It, it, it was all NASA directing it, and then they would hire companies on a cost plus basis. So they would say, okay, we need you know, a big uh, you know, wing of the rocket, right? Oof, okay. careful with that guy. <laughs> all right, that'll be just a couple billion dollars. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so anyway, so on a cost plus basis, sorry, what am no, I doing? No, leave it down there, it's fine. Right. Yeah, so, so anyway, they would, um, they would do things uh, on a cost plus basis, and then all the risk, like if uh, your entire shuttle broke, uh, would be would be borne by the by NASA rather than the companies. And they're just saying, "All right, give us this, and you know we'll kind of control the whole process." And huh. you you go out and buy stuff, and we'll give you back cost plus a bit. Now what they're doing is they've shifted. Um, they, they have a new project called the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program, funded in 2015. Um, which also known as COTS, which also stands for commercial off the shelf in other contexts. So they're, they're kind of huh. very purposely trying to go toward a more, more commercial um, model, public-private partnership. Basically, NASA is the customer and the partner, Okay. and he, it's not the, the supervisor. It, it's a whole kind of regime that's known as new space. So if something goes wrong, who pays for it? The company. And there have been companies that have gone out of business because they didn't deliver things to NASA on time. So the company bears the risks. They also bear the profits. And unlike in the past, they get to keep the intellectual property. That kind of makes more sense. You know, I mean, but you do want to encourage that sort of research so I can understand the other model as well. Yeah, but, but the idea is that NASA still gets to encourage research, but they're just not directing it. And the idea is, you know, we're at a point where at some point, uh, the, the government steps back and says, okay, we, we've done what we needed to do. Let's let private companies go ahead and, and, and make billions of dollars. And that's sort of where we are with space. So, so the... The new economic frontier, as you will. Yeah. So, so you know, this has led to companies in, in all sorts of, of things. So SpaceX is, is the most prominent one. Uh, as, and as Elon Musk tweeted last year, SpaceX could not do this without NASA can't express enough appreciation. So all these companies are sort of finding ways to get in this new niche of the near Earth or, or even medium range stuff that NASA is no longer particularly interested in. So this is where Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos stand to actually make quite a bit of money. I mean, if their projects pay off, they could reap huge rewards in this, in this scenario. Yes, but here's the, here's the thing. This is such a fascinating landscape because it still takes a ton of coordination. Uh, there's a great line from this paper that, that uh, I'll read here, quote, low cost launches are still expensive if there is nothing to do and nowhere to go in space. In other words, you know, I don't care if it's 12 bucks, I'm not gonna go out just to see nothing or not, you know, you gotta have, gotta have some action, gotta have something to do. And so it takes coordination of, you know, some, some companies maybe will make private space stations, some companies will do private launches, but then there's a whole realm 
that, that I, I think you might have a special interest in. Yeah? Asteroid mining. Asteroid mining, oh! So, so Roger, did- Happy days. Happy days. Yeah, okay. Well, it means that I my theory see. might have been a little bit correct. Yes, 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 exactly. I'll give you an eight. Yeah, okay. So, so Roger, tell us about the, the scope of the potential opportunity here. Well, the, I mean, the, the numbers they're talking about are absolutely huge. They are, I mean, they, they reckon the first um, Earth trillionaire will come from mining in space. Um, they think that, and the Goldman Sachs thing did a study, and they said that one football pitched asteroid could be worth between 25 and 50 billion. And there's much, much bigger asteroids out there. And some of these, the reason why they're worth this is because they're made of pure metal, such as platinum, some of them. They might be iron, they might be cobalt, but some of them are, are pretty pure. Whereas when you're mining on Earth, most of the Earth is just dirt. And up there, it's quite pure. So the, the opportunity is very, very big. Is there gold out there? Not kind of obviously, no. I mean, that's what everyone, no, yeah. they're, they're all sort of things which you're not really going to get that excited about. Hey, but you know what? Gold is the precious, oh, wow. Gold is the precious metal of yesterday, and the precious metal of tomorrow will be found in space. Cobalt. <laughs> sure. I, I, just, I just cobalt thing, rings. No, I'm, no, but cobalt is huge in batteries, actually, yeah, which I've true. been researching. But you know what? Let's let's not stay so tethered to our Earth-based conceptions of value, Justine. Okay. Right? So, so now here's an interesting question, right? If I go up to an asteroid and I say, "This is Alex's asteroid," is it? Yeah. Who owns it? Who owns space? Mm. Ah, so now we get into like international space stations and um, committees and stuff like that. Because yeah. who owns who owns the water? Who owns uh, outer space? Yes. And so maritime law is very well established. Yeah. Space law is not. There was a big treaty passed in 1967 that still gives us the, the fundamentals of, of space law. It's called the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. And the treaty says a few things. You can't put weapons of mass destruction into orbit. Sounds okay. good to me. Sounds reasonable. Uh, especially with all that space debris flying around. Uh, you cannot use the moon for military exercises. Interesting. It just feels very 60s. Sure. I love it. And the exploration of celestial bodies has to benefit all countries. And perhaps the most important part is we consider interplanetary travel. And I quote, Outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. In other words, when the U.S. planted a flag on the moon, did that mean it was the U.S.'s moon? No. No, it doesn't. Was that illegal, though? Oh, you can plant a flag wherever you want. You can't do a military exercise. But, but Oh, it, it doesn't mean it's yours, though. Right, yeah. and, and that was the point, because this was passed in, in 1967 and ratified by the U.S. In, in addition to a ton of other countries. This is so crazy. I feel like this is where the next wars are going to be fought. Yes. Well, we're, we're, we're trying to trying to not, avoid that with, with the treaty. I, but, I mean, I just want to make a quick note. Uh, there's a huge issue as to who owns the Arctic. Um, right. and, and so there's actually kind of a subversion and, a, like, smaller wars being fought as to, to gain control of, over that land where no country really owns it. So I can imagine just space is, and especially if there's valuable minerals up there, that becomes a whole other big issue. It certainly does. So, so Antarctica is... There, it, people struggle to look for precedents. Antarctica is one of the precedents that makes people kind of optimistic because everyone can sort of go if you really want, but it's pretty tightly controlled. It's been relatively well preserved um, from from really overt human interaction. But uh, so so what's interesting about this law? There are several things that are interesting about this law. One is that there's sort of it's kind of confusing because I'm I can go up, I can see it. Everything I do has to be for the benefit of the whole world. Well, I'm the one who paid all the money. It's, it, it strikes me a, a bit funny, right? Yeah. And it doesn't say, it says you can't say this is my celestial body. Can you take <laughs> everything from the celestial body and destroy it? That is not covered in the law. And so we've seen two distinct interpretations emerge. Interesting. So Russia's interpretation is, and, and I'm quoting uh, space lawyer Franz Vanderdunk, I did huh. not make that stuff up. Space lawyer Franz von der Dunk, quote, the moon and asteroids belong to humanity as a whole, and therefore the potential benefits from commercial exploitation should somehow accrue for humanity as a whole. That's him summing up Russia's view. As you can tell, and also by the, you can tell by the fact that he's a space lawyer, he doesn't really believe that that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, you know, other countries, Brazil, have sort of gone somewhat in this direction, but not important space-faring nations, really just Russia. The U.S., on the other hand, 
passed a law. They passed the U.S. Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act of 2015, which includes uh, the within that act the Spurring Private Aerospace Competitiveness and Entrepreneurship Act of 2015. So what does that stand for? What are, what's that acronym? Spurring Private Aerospace Competitiveness and oh, Entrepreneurship. Space. Yeah, isn't That's that bad? Isn't that bad? Yeah. So, so the act, uh, the, the Space Act said this, and I quote, a United States citizen engaged in commercial recovery of an asteroid resource or a space resource under this chapter shall be entitled to any asteroid resource or space resource obtained, including to possess, own, transport, use, and sell the asteroid resource or space resource obtained in accordance with the applicable law, including the international obligation of the United States, although they add, it is the sense of Congress that by the enactment of this act, the United States does not thereby assert sovereignty or sovereign or exclusive rights or jurisdiction over or the ownership over of any celestial body. So they really have the treaty in mind, and they're, they're, you could tell they're feeling out the law, right? Because they say, it is the sense of Congress that this doesn't infringe because there's just two interpretations of this law. There's no Supreme Court of the world. Right. There's no Supreme Court of space. And there, it's just not clear how this is going to work. It's crazy because it actually seems like the U.S. here is more of the aggressor, whereas Russia is kind of taking a, a back seat here. They're, they don't necessarily want the mining to be to be personalized. <laughs> I love that sort of, oh, this is unusual. It's it's, it's us being, <laughs> they're no, normally no. the aggressor, those damn no, Russians. But, but no, it, it is interesting because if you, we were talking about the Arctic, yeah. in the so not the Antarctic, in the Arctic Correct. specifically where there are oil resources, Russia has been very aggressive. And that's because they kind of surround most of it. And yes. the U.S. has a little tiny bit. Well, well, but, but China's but been Canada. a really aggressive one because they don't have any of it, but they've sort of that, done that thing where they go, and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yes, but but see, the distinction here is that the U.S. is more advanced in going to space. Ah, so there are interests at play here, yeah, exactly. as there always are. But it's just fascinating because the U.S. passed this law in 2015 saying, okay, if an American goes up, mine something, you get to keep it. And it's like, that's what the U.S. says. But there, you know what I mean? There's no international buy an asteroid doesn't belong to the U.S., as they note. Um, so here's, here's where it gets, I'm going to kind of get to the, to the Qatar knockout effect, which we, we've left that in the rear view mirror. But the question is, who else has taken a permissive view on asteroid mining? If you had to guess, think of a country that's like, go for it. That's, uh, Qatar? Mm. <laughs> no. <laughs> country that's like, go for it, Qatar? No. no. Um, Saudi Arabia? Actually, uh, Saudi Arabia has taken a rather permissive view. Okay. Uh, but that's not what we had in mind. Uh, Roger? Well, I do know the answer. Do you want me to give that? Yeah, why not yes. you? So it's Luxembourg. Oh, yeah. I so would not Qatar have... Or Qatar. Well, it's a tax haven, you know. Yeah. Okay. And when they did do, um, they actually did satellites in the 1980s when the Europeans started getting into it. So they, they've got a little bit of form there. Huh. Yeah, so they've kind of used their satellite expertise, and they, be, they became, last year, the first European country to pass law that gives companies the right to own any resources they extract from space. And what makes their law different from the U.S. law, it's very similar, but the U.S. law only applies to U.S. citizens. The Luxembourg law applies to anyone with a Luxembourg address. Bizarre. So if you're headquartered in Luxembourg, if you're a Luxembourg company, you can, you can go for it. According to Luxembourg. Well, yes. yes. <laughs> what, it's a basically like they, yeah. they've got a tax haven state, and they've said, well, it's a satellite haven state. So anyone can come oh, here, and anyone so can go. more so, people are going to flood to Luxembourg. Exactly, yeah. Well, it's not for the tax bit, but it's, it's yeah. kind of using the same mentality. No, but I mean, if you're, if you're SpaceX or something, maybe you want to be headquartered in Lu Luxembourg. Yeah, so, so SpaceX isn't doing asteroid mining, but the two biggest asteroid mining companies are Planetary Resources and Deep Space, Industry, Deep Space Industries. Both... Both sound like, like the evil company in Devon's uh, film, right? And they're, they're the leading asteroid mining companies. They're headquartered in Luxembourg. Not only that, but the Luxembourg government invested equity in planetary resources and provided R&D funding to deep space industries. Like, they are, they, they don't have many resources on Earth, so they're very committed to finding the resources in, in asteroids. Wow. So they're going to start, yeah, they're really trying to attract people and businesses to Luxembourg until other countries freak out. Yeah, but you know what? Maybe they have a big first mover advantage. Yeah. And also, they, the tax status really helps as well. Um, and so the interesting thing is that Luxembourg is not exactly struggling, which is where we, we finally get to get to the punchline here. Maybe, Raj, you can help me explain, uh, explain how Luxembourg is doing. Well, Luxembourg is doing very well in terms of uh, GDP per capita. It's about 102,000. 
Um, so $102,000, and I think that puts it second or third, probably around about second. There's one country that's ahead of it, though. Do you know which one that would be? Qatar. Hey, Yay. there we go. I think it's 124000 according to most recent estimates, because ah. obviously of their, their natural resources. So Luxembourg and them are having a bit of a competition. Ah, so uh, Luxembourg might take the title of most uh, GDP per capita. Mm -hmm. I, I think so, and, and, and you know what? I was sort of joking about gold, but hey, maybe, maybe space minerals and precious metals and all sorts of resources are going to be to the next several centuries what oil has been to, to the prior few centuries, right? So, yeah. and, and so you would see it move from, from Qatar to Luxembourg in terms of the capital of wealth. It's interesting because, you know, you have all these countries that try to have, you know, tax advantages. So I think of Ireland as sure. having a certain thing or um, a lot of Caribbean islands. And so, or even in the U.S., uh, Delaware has very favorable treatment towards companies. So see, I've see, seen Luxembourg be called the Delaware of space. Oh, is it, yeah. is it really? Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, so it's sort of like um, this is the next age of trying to attract businesses and wealth to your country or place or wherever. Uh, so that's fascinating. Yeah, and you know Luxembourg is part of the EU, right? So if you if you do it in Luxembourg, then and and so I think there's going to be a crackdown. I don't think that could last. Well, so then the UN has to get their their shit together, mm -hmm. and the US has already done this really permissive law. Yeah. So. Well, then the U.S. has to get us act together. Otherwise, everything's going to Luxembourg. Could could happen. And I just want to add, um, you know, we, we've gotten to the to the destination. Yeah. It's all very, uh, you know, sort of happy. Uh, I would say, kind of optimistic. There are some some downsides. Uh oh. As the U.S. moves away from a command and control model, more companies have a chance to to commandeer space. Uh, companies and countries it leads to those kind of negative externalities that we seem to be looping back on these past several weeks. A big externality is space debris. Ah. And the amount of space debris has, look at this chart, skyrocketed in recent years. Uh, skyrocketed is not even really an appropriate term since it's above the sky, but um, it, it has risen dramatically due to, there was a China military test conducted in space where they basically it had an anti-ballistic test and they hit one of their own defunct satellites on purpose and it created a huge amount of space debris. Oh. And, and space debris is really, really dangerous because if you think about it, the, the main thing that causes disasters in space is space debris. And so the main cause of space debris is disasters in space. There's, so there's actually a theory from Donald Kessler, a uh, NASA scientist in the 70s, that it, we could have an uncontrollable we could have a, a chain of uncontrollable reactions where debris creates collisions that lead to more debris, and that you couldn't even fly a satellite anymore because you'd just constantly be hit by these little... I mean, something the size of a cherry has the impact of a grenade when it's whoosh, whipping around the planet. Yeah. So if, if we don't deal with these externalities, and it's very hard to penalize people for space debris, it's hard to even tell who is responsible for it, then we actually could end up not being able to use space at all and then forget about, you know, Mining, who knows, but forget about tourism, forget about all these other things that we want to do out there. We need an international space committee. I think we do, but uh, yeah. it's going to be tough that to organize. That would be um, a libertarian nightmare, too. Yes, and so you mentioned seasteading. There's been a lot of comparisons to, to seasteading. Um, and it's one of these interesting things. Like, it's another question about the internet. Like, is it free because the government hasn't gotten their act together, or is it free because it should be in some way? Wait, so then do we not get to eat any of oh, this? Oh, go eat the space ice cream. This didn't really play into it. Oh, but, uh, okay. I just want to say this is by far my favorite treat ever. Really? Uh-huh. Oh, you, you oh my gosh. Mm, I, I would buy these in the, by the dozen. Really? Online. See, yeah. that, that I didn't even have that down space as one of the space-related companies. Oh, no, this is... Okay, so then, yeah, another, another business model that might win is... Uh, Space food, if we are sending more people up there. What, what do you think, Professor? Have I convinced you that, that Qatar has to be worried if NASA wants to go to Mars? No, I think I mean, it's still about 10, 15 um, years away before we get there and all the rest of it. I think the real, the real value is, is going to be in, because these spaceships, will they get there, will they, will they or won't they? But before then, it's going to be the, um, the ones who make, I think, the robots and the robotic vehicles, because mm -hmm. they're going to have to go up, and they, they're the ones that will be needed, and they will find other uses for those on land as well. So... It's just the whole pushing of technology. And Luxembourg, well, they're rich anyway. Getting a bit richer, who cares? <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, okay, so thank you for joining us this week on the knock-on effect. 
We are back every Thursday. And you should make sure to check out our current promotion. We are running a promotion with Business Insider. So if you sign up now for Real Vision, if you've been waiting for that, you get free access to Business Insider Prime, which is worth $99 per year. And you can find out more at www.realvision.com slash business hyphen insider. And if you're already a subscriber, you know what? Go out, tell your friends, this is the time. The time is now. To subscribe. Yes. Well, thank you guys. It's been great being in New York for these uh, two, yeah. two weeks and these three episodes. So um, I, I look forward to coming back sometime in the near future. Yeah, just make sure, watch out for the space debris as you as you fly back to the ah, US. Yeah. yeah, I'm on the cheap airlines. <laughs> okay, fine. You can eat this? Yeah, go hard. Uh -huh. uh, that's mm. weird. Oh. That was good. Can't. <laughs> All right, that's it.